Good evening, and welcome to Let's Talk with Lou. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be on the air at Community TV of Santa Cruz. And uh, once again, we have a wonderful guest this evening that hardly needs an introduction because he's done, done so much for our community. Uh, and uh, for, for the most part, he is well known, and that is, of course, uh, John Laird. And welcome to the show this evening, John. Thanks, Lou. Great to be here. Good to have you. Um, Community TV broadcasts on channel uh, 27 and 73, uh, but uh, we will be uh, broadcasting uh, this video uh, in uh, Monterey County as well. And uh, John has got a lot of information. He's running for political office, but I want to give a lot of bio and a background of who he is and what he's done in this community because uh, he's done a ton of stuff for us. John Laird uh, served as the California Secretary of Natural Resources by Governor Jerry Brown from January uh, 2011 until 2019. And John also served as a member of the State Integrated Waste Management Board from 2008 to 2009 and taught state environmental policy at the University of California of Santa Cruz. Uh, he uh, not only is a teacher, but he is also a legislator and has been a legislator in the past. He was elected as the assembly member for the 27th district which included portions of Monterey, Santa Clara, Santa Cruz County, and he was reelected for at two, 2004 and 2006 while serving the maximum three terms in the assembly. John Laird authored 82 bills that were signed into law. A busy man. Um, prior to serving the state assembly, John uh, was elected member of the Carrillo College Board of Trustees uh, from 1994 to 2002. Uh, John also served as the executive director of the Santa Cruz AIDS Project from 91 to 94, uh, and he is the son of teachers uh, and raised in Vallejo. John graduated with honors uh, in pol political science politics from the University of California at Santa Cruz in 1972. He's been a longtime resident of Santa Cruz with his spouse, John Flores. He has traveled extensively and is fluent in Spanish, enjoys conducting family history research, and is a lifelong Chicago Cubs fan. For us uh, uh, <laughs> the, that are Giants fans, you might have a little bit of an issue with that, John, but nonetheless, you're welcome this evening. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, John, um, I was wondering if uh, you could comment a little bit, and I have to talk about this because I uh, uh, am a former board uh, member of Community TV, and uh, you made a significant difference in the way that Community TV of Santa Cruz does their business when you were on the state assembly, uh, and I have to give you credit, I get to toot your horn a little bit, but this is a show you don't get to be bashful about. <laughs> but could you tell us a little bit about the DIVCA and what happened with that, and why is Community, of, community TV of Santa Cruz a, a little bit different than other community TV uh, stations throughout the state? Well, one thing that happened was, and this was when I was a mayor and on the city council, together with the county board of supervisors, we tried to protect the interests of the general public here in cable TV. And the real issue was at the time, there was 93% cable usage in Santa Cruz County because the users were hostages. Uh, you couldn't get more than three channels unassisted, so people bought cable. And we tried to uh, award a franchise, the city and the county. There had been the sweetheart law adopted by Congress. It led to a long lawsuit. And at the end of the lawsuit, uh, we got three community TV uh, channels uh, to be uh, provided by the cable provider. We got 100 miles of line extensions into the rural areas so that people had, would have access. And we got rate protections at the basic cable level so that you would um, not be hostage. They just wouldn't be raised regularly since you had no choice but to have cable. And then I moved to the assembly, and there's a bill to do statewide franchises for cable, override the local franchises mm -hmm. awarded by cities and counties. Mm -hmm. And this bill sailed through. It was really contentious. And I very quietly, it didn't float out there till a week before the end of the session, I got a complete carve out for Santa Cruz County out of that bill that as long as we had a federal court, a consent decree, that would rule. So for an extra eight years, uh, community TV got paid for by cable, 
we finished those line extensions and the rate protections remained in place. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things that Monterey wanted it. Mm -hmm. I represented Monterey at mm -hmm. the time, mm -hmm. but they didn't have the same underlying legal thing. Mm -hmm. So I actually did something that was very uncharacteristic for a politician. Mm -hmm. I didn't claim credit. And people would write letters and there was this front page article of people being astonished in Santa Cruz that this special thing had happened, but mm -hmm. I didn't go around uh, uh, tooting my horn on it at the time. But we get to toot a little bit of your horn now, though. So, well, it's great. I'm going up to a community meeting at the summit in a couple of weeks, and they all remember it because yeah. a lot of people up there got cable mm -hmm. uh, because the line extensions went to that area of the county. Very good. Very good. Well, we uh, thank you at Community TV for all that you've done. Uh, we've had some communication uh, about getting together for the show, and, and I, I reminded you that we all have appreciated what you've done, and uh, it, it has not gone, it doesn't, it didn't go unnoticed. So uh, we all, we have talked about it over the years. So thank you for that. Um, you are running for uh, a state senate position uh, a, uh, in District 17, which is our district, and that's currently held by uh, Bill Monning, and he's uh, terming out. Uh, and uh, I want to uh, first of all ask, um, what does a state senator uh, do? If you can give us some general criteria, uh, if, uh, if, if you were to be elected to that position, uh, what might your job description be? And just to be very basic, uh, there are 40 state senators in California. Mm -hmm. And since we're almost at 40 million people, mm -hmm. uh, there are a million people in every Senate district. Mm -hmm. and you know, I had a friend that was in the, uh, the Maine State Senate, and I asked her, how many voters are there in your district? I think there were 6,000 or 8,000. And I said, how do you campaign? She said, on my bicycle. <laughs> and uh, it is so different in California. Yeah. And, and this district that Bill Monning represents very ably right now runs from the city of San Jose, where there's 10% of the city of San Jose, through all of Santa Cruz County, mm -hmm. uh, through coastal Monterey, and a little bit of southern Monterey County across, and then all of San Luis Obispo County. So it goes from East San Jose to the San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara County line. Mm -hmm. And so in general, when you're in the Senate, uh, you try to look out for your district. There are special issues. You're the one that's supposed to advocate and bring to the table the interests uh, of that district. And mm -hmm. this one has 21 cities, mm -hmm. amazing coastal area. It's amazingly fire prone. It's one of the few districts that has all three levels of higher education. Mm -hmm. There uh, is a housing crisis that's off the charts. Mm -hmm. And so it's trying to take those issues and, and represent them. At the same time, the actual duties of the Senate are to adopt legislation, to join with the Assembly and approve a budget that goes to the governor, and it's over $200 billion now. I was budget chair most of my run in the State Assembly. You so were was, budget chair? Yes, so okay. uh, it wasn't just 82 bills, which was a phenomenal number of bills. I was shepherding the budget through the process mm -hmm. at the time. And, um, and then it's to author and hope to see enacted individual pieces of legislation that might be on a wide range of things. I did, uh, the bill I was proud of most was to establish the Sierra Nevada Conservancy. I did a bill to restore health services at community colleges. I did a whole host of water conservation bills. Uh, I tried to be Mr. Fix-It on things for the district, mm -hmm. but also statewide. And so legislation, budget, you're doing oversight of state government, you're representing your district. That is really the job description of a senator or a legislator. Very good. We will get uh, towards the end. Um, we're gonna talk about um, some things that you are most proud of, and uh, you don't get to be bashful there for sure. Uh, and you've done some great things. Uh, and we're gonna talk about uh, your most prominent accomplishments. Um, I think our listening audience needs to know those things because you've done so many things. Uh, and you've done them in so many different places, uh, you know, with Cabrillo and the Assembly, Santa Cruz City Council, uh, and then we'll certainly talk about the California Secretary for Natural Resources, a state commission position, 
and then also talk about uh, your position at the Santa Cruz AIDS Project at the very end, because I want our listening audience to remember all those things. Uh, quite frankly, it, it, part of it is when they go to the polls and, and they remember those things that have been done already for this area uh, in, in up and down the state, and hopefully that you'll be representing all the way to San Luis Obispo. Well, well, I think the important thing too is, is that it's really interesting because there are some people that are getting elected to the legislature now mm -hmm. that have no prior experience in a public position. Yes. And they struggle. And, you know, they had this big debate about whether to continue redevelopment agencies. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, I was the chair of one. And, and so it really helps in that broad base of, uh, of experience to sort of bring it to broad deliberations that are on the same issues at the state level. Well, it sounds to me like a, that when you uh, get into that, a position like that, you, you get to hit the ground with both feet running, uh, and you don't have to do a lot of a learning curve. Having been elected a few times myself, there's always a big learning curve, but it sounds like there's less of one. Yes, but it, it, I think it's one of the reasons I uh, was chosen as budget chair and had a good uh, run because I had done the county's health and social services budget as a county staffer. I'd been a community college trustee. Mm -hmm. I'd been a mayor and council member. I'd been on the transit board. I'd been on the transportation commission. Mm -hmm. I'd been on the waste board. Uh, I, I'd done a whole host of things. And as a result, except for prisons, I think I had had my hand in some of the major pieces of state government across the board. And then that allowed me to go into the budget position mm -hmm. and actually have an understanding of how it all fit together. And I had some colleagues from Los Angeles that I loved and still love, mm -hmm. but they might have done one thing. They might have been on a school board and they went up there. And I remember talking to one and trying to explain what an agricultural commissioner did. Mm -hmm. And they just looked at me blankly because they just didn't have that experience in the urban area of Southern California. Sure. Okay. Do you have um, any uh, particular goals uh, if elected to this position? Uh, what, what are those kinds of things that, I guess uh, this is a twofold question, what are those kinds of things that you'd like to see continued uh, that uh, Senator uh, Monning has started uh, and then also uh, any of your own particular goals and, and kind of uh, burning issues that you'd like to address um, that you feel like you have a, a good handle on. Certainly you're going to be doing a lot of stuff, but is there any particular ones that you have an well, eye on? You see, I think there's some major goals, and the question is, is what can you do toward them? And Bill's done some good things toward them. I'd probably want to take it to the next level. And I mean, one of them is health care and access, so you have mm -hmm. universal access or or some single payer, some system that covers everybody for health care. Mm -hmm. And we have had to sort of step in uh, behind the national assault on Obamacare and protect that before we even can talk about doing anything more. Mm -hmm. We have a housing crisis here. Bill's done some things on that. I'd like to, uh, to work on it because it's really significant. I was one of the governor's point people on climate change, mm -hmm. and that's just the signature issue of our time. And it comes out in many different ways. I mean, I was just in charge of fire mm -hmm. for eight years, and the worst time uh, we have had for fire in, in California history, mm -hmm. and in part because of climate. Uh, but we just have, to, this district is particularly fire prone from the Santa Cruz Mountains to east of Morgan Hill to the mountains behind Carmel Valley and down through Big Sur in San Luis Obispo. There's some particular fire prone areas. And as an ocean uh, bounding the west of the district the whole way, we have sea level rise. We have, a, I just headed the state's oceans program for eight years. And <laughs> we have big challenges with the oceans, whether it's acidification or marine debris or managing fisheries so they're sustainable. Mm -hmm. Those are big deals and so, um, you know, and then public education, having been a community college trustee, sure. we're still really challenged in education in California. And the budget that was just passed puts more to it than at any time in history. And yes, we have, and yet we have teachers striking across the state mm -hmm. because they can't keep up with housing prices and, and sort of the commitment to education is going to be a real issue over time. Mm -hmm. We're not doing enough. And so... It, it, whether you're a budget chair or do bills or work with your colleagues, you take it part of the way, but you always have to move that down uh, the road. Very good. So the pressing 
Uh, you know, kind of got I got a sense of uh, uh, what your particular goals might be, but um, take it maybe a step further or maybe a sidestep. Uh, what do you think is going to be pressing you the most uh, if you were a, a, a state senator right now, and what what would be the most challenging issues that you'd have to kind of take head on that um, would be uh, difficult? Uh, certainly, there's a whole bunch of them. But do you have, let's say, your top three that might? Well, there's a couple right at the top. Uh, uh, one is is just housing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it is off the charts, and we uh, can't afford to uh, have service people live here. Mm -hmm. it, it's a struggle for teachers to live here. Mm -hmm. There was just a survey done nationally that showed that Santa Cruz was, I think, in the top five communities in the country for not being able to be affordable to teachers. Mm -hmm. And our whole quality of life is going to change unless we figure something out. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are going to be a lot of conflicting values. I mean, there's been a bill that's very controversial from Sacramento that would over, override local land use. Um, and the state has done a housing bond for 50,000 units of affordable housing. Uh, there's, the Central Coast is unique in that it does not import water. You look at the big counties across the state, they all import water. Santa Cruz and Monterey don't. Mm -hmm. And so it's not as if there is this uh, ready-made infrastructure uh, for additional growth. So there's some big challenges uh, there. And the other one is, I really think, with climate, and in particular fire in this area. Mm -hmm. and, and part of it that I didn't talk about in raising it before is, we're watching PG&E go into bankruptcy. Um, as we filmed this, they did a, a billion dollar settlement with cities and counties that were impacted by fires that they were involved in the ignition uh, with. Just recently, one of the legislators that chaired the fire committee last year proposed a 25 to 50 billion fund that PG&E should come up with uh, to try to handle the liability and the issues. And, and I think there's this real difficult thing because they are liable. They should be liable. Mm -hmm. They should make good on what their obligations are. And then there's a point at which they go belly up. And so how do you decide how you get every ounce of what they owe to people out of them and not drive them uh, completely out of business? And that's the challenge that they're facing in Sacramento and they did a good job with a bill last year, but they sort of kicked it down the road for a year or two. Fire being one of the big issues that uh, are, is in our region, uh, all the way down to San Luis Obispo, of course, uh, with all the fires that we've had in the past. Um, have you got some ideas uh, that you maybe would like to share to be able to circumvent that um, from, uh, let's say, your position if you were to become a, a senator in Sacramento? Um, is there any particular things that you might do slightly different, majorly differently, or what would you, how would you accomplish some of your goals? Well, well first, uh, I should describe the problem a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, of the 20 most uh, uh, significant fires we've had in California in its history, 15 have been uh, since 2000, and 10 of them have been in just the last four years. Mm -hmm. The fire season that was 25 years ago is now a month longer at the beginning a month longer at the end, and that's if the fire season stops. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of times in the eight years I was secretary. I, I mean, the fire chief in Big Sur lost her house to a Big Sur fire in January, mm -hmm. when that is one of the wetter places uh, uh, in the state normally. And then the fire behavior, because of this, has become extreme. So last year in Reading, we had a fire tornado, just like a Midwest tornado mm -hmm. that went through mm -hmm. the middle of the fire. Mm -hmm. The fire in Paradise moved at 60 acres a minute. 60 oh. acres a minute. You, wow. They actually had an evacuation plan, uh -huh. and they'd practiced it, where they'd reversed the main road, they were going to evacuate in zones. Mm -hmm. At 60 acres in a minute, they had no chance. They just all had to get out, and it uh -huh. led to the fatalities and, and the problem with 95% of the structures in the city uh, uh, burning down. So when you got that problem, the question of what to do, mm -hmm. it's 25% um, of California is in high fire areas, and parts of that are in Santa Cruz, Santa Clara, Monterey, and San Luis Obispo counties. Uh, Governor Brown uh, did an executive order and established uh, more um, six more fire crews statewide to do prescribed fires, which are controlled burns on the shoulder of the season, mm -hmm. to try to do protection of areas 
and then also doubled the number of acres to 500,000 acres in California, which is still a drop in the bucket, uh, to treat, to try to remove underbrush, to do the kinds mm -hmm. of things. And one of them here is in the Aptos Hills that Governor Newsom has since prioritized with that money. So there are, there is a, a whole issue of uh, sort of preparing with underbrush, doing controlled fires, having people deal differently with defensible space. And a lot of it is just uh, out and out public safety uh, and preparing in a different way because people aren't ready the way they were. Uh, uh, last year, uh, the CAL FIRE chief, who I worked very closely with, said that traditionally, we only had a one 90,000 acre fire in a year. That mm -hmm. was considered the big fire. Last mm -hmm. year, I think we had five of them before June 1st. Wow. And so uh, part of it is, is having people understand that mm -hmm. this has changed. Mm -hmm. Because there's a scientist that, is that grew up, went to Mount Madonna School, grad school at UCSC, who's one of the leading climate scientists mm -hmm. at Stanford, Noah Diffenbaugh. And his statement, he's great because he does the science and then he can explain it mm -hmm. clearly. Mm -hmm. And his clear explanation was, is we've been living in one climate, we're actually in a different climate, but all our infrastructure and our assumptions were based on the climate that we don't live in right now. And so part of the problem is not just doing all the things I laid out on fire, but bringing the public, the policymakers, and everybody along to understand that the world is really different, and we have to face it that way. Wow, wow. Uh, that's the first time I had heard that. Uh, I try to keep uh, abreast on uh, those kind of like local issues that affect us uh, with uh, national and statewide journals, uh, 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 trade journals in my business. Um, I wasn't aware of that. You know, um, with uh, talking about the pressing challenges that uh, you have, uh, you might have in this district, um, would you say that uh, having served as an assemblyman in the 29th district in 2002, 2004, and 2006, uh, that you are comfortable, do you feel like you might have greater familiarity with uh, the use of these partial overlapping districts? Um, I guess what I'm saying is if you come in and it w are the same kind of issues, I'm not sure how it, that works, but are the same kind of issues, certainly that was years ago, uh, in the assembly, do they, you know, can they transfer over so you're kind of familiar with some of the stuff because you've been an assembly person already? Does, yes. that, does that help? Yes, <clears throat> both in the process in Sacramento, in the people in the district, in the issues in the district, mm -hmm. and it's twice as large, so I am really, even though, I've run there before and have uh, worked in San Luis Obispo. I'm working really hard to spend time there, get completely up to speed on their issues, meet with local people and build relationships mm -hmm. so that you can pick up the phone or they can pick up the phone and you can connect when something uh, happens. But I like to tell this one story about Jerry Brown. I think we were in the first months of the administration when I was in the cabinet. And he, he called me up and he said, uh, you know, we were doing this thing for salmon in 1979. Is it still going on? And I realized that in briefing him, I had to sort of describe what had happened in the 28 years between his governor services, because some things he just hadn't kept abreast of. And in a small way, there are a few things like that for me in the 10 years since I left the assembly, where while I was working 60 hours a week on resources issues, uh, and I was at cabinet meetings where they might have talked about health care mm -hmm. or other things. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get back into the weeds with people at the local level on some of those issues that weren't my primary issues in the last decade. So mm -hmm. it really helps, but I really need to get up to say, I mean, in the last few weeks, uh, I had a dinner with all the members of the uh, board, local board of the Medical Society. I had dinner with all the CEOs of hospitals in the greater Monterey Bay area. Mm -hmm. I, I went to a picket line of healthcare workers and have worked with the, the healthcare workers. I sat at a labor dinner with nurses and, and heard about things from them. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly I'm getting healthcare from every uh, perspective in the mm -hmm. system, which is, I mean, today, uh, as we film this, I drove in from Sacramento and I spent an hour with the state board of the dentists, the dental association this morning. Mm -hmm. And they talked about how they related to the medical system, what their issues were. Mm -hmm. And I'm getting back up to speed. And if you do this right, you move around the district for a year and a half or two years, 
you meet every major person in government mm -hmm. or different community groups or on different issues. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know, some of them, I mean, I went to, I was meeting with an Atascadero city council member and she said, we want to get uh, liquor permits for new restaurants in our downtown and uh, state beverage, uh, alcoholic beverage control said, no, you're not that kind of town. We don't want to give you many more liquor permits for after six o'clock in your downtown. And mm -hmm. San Luis Obispo is 15 miles away where you could probably get uh, liquor on the curb at any time uh, uh, up till midnight or 2 a.m. In Paso Robles, the uh, city council member said to me, you know, they, Caltrans wants um, us to build an overpass over a state highway in the city at 100% our expense. Mm -hmm. There's a state park for off-road vehicles down there that blows a, a sand into the adjacent neighborhood. Uh, Hearst Castle is the biggest uh, state park in terms of visitation a year. You move through and you learn who is doing different things and then if you get to Sacramento, it's so intense in Sacramento, you go through hearings and bills, but you'll be in the middle of a hearing and somebody will say, now Hearst Park something, and you will have been there, you'll have mm. met with the workers, mm -hmm. you've gone over it, and you'll say, oh no, that's not the issue. And you can just represent people in the moment on whatever the issue is. And so if you do this right, mm -hmm. and I just talked about the southern part of the district, it's exactly the same in the north. They're just issues all over, whether it's the Monterey Peninsula or Santa Cruz County or southern Santa Clara County that, that people want to bring to your attention. And, and it's really helpful. I enjoy it. Uh, uh, it's like a field trip. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Um, somebody once said that if you're doing uh, what you would do uh, recreationally uh, as a job, there is no job. It's all just a, a, a labor of love. It sounds like that's what, uh, that's what you're doing. That's, that's great. We're just kind of doing all the hard work right now. Um, you know, the, uh, we're talking about oceans policy changing. Um, and I was wondering if you know, we might be able to, or you might be able to, uh, to talk about this uh, since you uh, have been uh, decided to run for the state uh, Senate District 17, which includes the District Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, parts of it, because uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think it goes even a little further. Uh, and, and then the Monterey Bay coastline, which is fully contained within the district. How might your leadership role with being a California Secretary of Natural Resources help District 7 uh, if elected? I, I, I looked as much as I could to see what that job description was. Since I've got you here, I'll ask you, what, how does that, um, what, what's the application there? We've got a beautiful coastline. Uh, it doesn't get any more beautiful. I, I think we, want to get, we have one of the best places. In, 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 I have a friend that used to play professional tennis and all over the world. He, he uh, lived here for 30 years of his, of his life. And he said, this is the most beautiful place in the world. Uh, it, and it's uh, something that I think that we all uh, uh, appreciate for sure, uh, but we want to keep that that way. So how, how might your overlapping with already have, having the experience, uh, and that is a state position that you had too, uh, uh, correct? Yes. Okay, so how would that overlap? Uh, but as part of the state position, I mean, the resources agency was not a small operation. So there were 25 departments, boards, commissions, 19,000 people, a $10 billion budget. I mean, I really had How many people? Uh, 19,000. And that was all your, yours? Yes. Wow. And, <clears throat> but one piece of it was the Oceans Program. So I actually chaired the Ocean Protection Council, which is the state agency to try to coordinate oceans programs. Okay. I would say our four biggest priorities were fisheries management. Uh, we have the largest network of marine protected areas off of any state. Uh, in the United States, uh, and we also have some fish where the populations have been challenged and we have to, by species, sort of work on them. We have a big marine debris problem. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody seems to know now about plastics, and a recent study that just came out uh, last week showed that microplastics were found even at deep depths in, depth in the Monterey Bay area that yeah. has gotten into yeah. Uh, everything. And, and so we had uh, uh, really strategies for trying to limit what went in the ocean. Mm -hmm. uh, we had to do the climate change adaptation in the sense that we did all the science on sea level rise and tried to do guidance to local governments about what's going to happen next to them in the ocean in the next uh, 80 years. And mm -hmm. it's going to be anywhere from a foot in 2050. 2050 to anywhere from three to five feet 
in 2100, and that's conservative of, of, of sea level rise. Oh, okay. and so, okay. and the thing about it is, is my example all the time is, is it's not this gradual bathtub filling in; it's the extreme event. It's the two-year-old cannonballing into the bathtub. And so, when the tsunami came in from the earthquake in, J in Japan in 2011, mm -hmm. it was at low tide, before sea level rise, and that uh, tsunami still really messed up the Santa Cruz Harbor and the Crescent City Harbor. Those were the two harbors in California that took the biggest hits from that. If we have sea level rise, something comes at high tide, that'll be much more dramatic uh, uh, in its impact. And then the fourth uh, sort of priority of the oceans program was ocean acidification. And the oceans take in the carbon. The only reason that the uh, the climate change isn't worse across the planet is that we're covered 70% by oceans. They've been absorbing a lot of the carbon, mm -hmm. but they're getting to a tipping point where the ocean is acidified so much from that mm -hmm. that if it continues at a certain level, it's really a problematic. And, and it's already, you watched a 60-minute story a couple of years ago in the Puget Sound. Mm -hmm. A shellfish was really affected by that. And so uh, with no national leadership going on on climate change right now, and in fact, uh, uh, us being pulled out of the Paris Climate Accords, we decided to work with Washington and Oregon and do international leadership on ocean acidification. So we did a three-state study that showed not just how bad it was on the science, but did a roadmap for early action steps. And I went uh, a year ago to the United Nations Oceans Conference and addressed them, and we formed an international alliance. So we actually had uh, the Netherlands, Iceland, France, Chile, United Arab Emirates, various- And you, and you were spearheading most of that? Uh, yeah, on behalf of the governor and together with Washington and Oregon, and we, wow. uh, uh, we signed them up. And, uh, and the condition was is everybody had to make a commitment to do their own project in their own country mm -hmm. on ocean acidification. And in the tropics, if you do mangroves here, if you do seagrass and other things, mm -hmm. it can both help with more absorption in a way that isn't bad, but take things out of the ocean that are there. So th there, there are a lot of things to do, and California was in the forefront of all of them. And, and one of the things in my political life is you do some things that are really unpleasant so you can spend some time on things that really drive you and you like mm -hmm. to do. So I had to work on oil and gas issues, which mm -hmm. uh, was painful a lot of times. And then I could work on oceans, which was a, a passion for me. And we could do international leadership and do things here and show the way with things that other states aren't doing. And I would like to continue uh, working on those issues in the legislature. As some of those uh, are some of those issues are they open ended now where there's been somebody else uh, since you've been you know you've been in office for a bit uh, uh, doing some of those things and continuing uh, uh, those uh, things that have been started or or are you going to have to kind of pick up and go from there or uh, no the the at least the institution of the Ocean Protection Council continues mm -hmm. and there's some legislators and our very own in this region Mark Stone mm -hmm. uh, was the assembly appointment to the Ocean Protection Council the last couple of years I chaired it. And it's really spearheaded issues on plastics and, and other things. And uh, so there are other people out there, but I just feel uniquely situated to mm. sort of take stock and try to make sure that we push it. And, and part of it is the budget, too. It's making sure that we invest where we're supposed to invest, not just in the policy with bills, but in the budget to make sure that we're doing those right things and we're making them happen. Wow, you've got a, a lot of depth with that, a lot of understanding. Uh, it's, uh, it's amazing. You bring a lot to the table. So, um, yeah, good stuff. You can tell that you, you've been uh, ahead of a state organization, uh, and, and bringing that to our district, I think, is pretty uh, particularly uh, a, a good thing, a big thing, um, it, it, because we're predominantly, you know, the biggest issue I think we have resources are, is our coastal areas, and to be able to protect those and do the kinds of things that you've done on an international level uh, it doesn't get any better than that. So uh, thank you for all that hard work, for sure. Um, 
You know, I wanted to move on a little bit, um, kind of one of my pet peeves uh, and, and, and talking on the phone, I think it was one of yours, but, um, and especially having been, uh, and, we, and we kind of touched on the subject a little bit, but housing, affordable housing in Santa Cruz. Uh, I read in the paper today, uh, the Santa Cruz Sentinel, um, a, an article in, in the, uh, the topic was, uh, Santa Cruz ranks as nation's least affordable city for teachers. Having been a Cabrillo College trustee and the president of the board, uh, it, you, you, I think, probably would have a, a big, you know, uh, love for doing something with that for sure. Uh, and not to uh, shortchange anybody else out there, but the, the seniors that are out there, you know, affordable housing for seniors is a big deal. Uh, maybe a, a lesser of a big deal, because I think a lot of folks come in from other areas, and uh, if they're going to retire here, uh, their, their dollar probably goes pretty well. And They've got their kids out of college and paid for the cars and done all the things that they're supposed to do so they can bring a lot of the equities from different parts of the state. But still, it's expensive here uh, for our senior populace as well. Uh, and then <clears throat> certain, uh, certainly for our students. Um, to quote another article uh, from the UCSC News Center, uh, this goes back to 2017, uh, nearly 70%, quote, unquote, uh, of uh, experience rent burdened people in Santa Cruz County live here according to the UC. Uh, SC survey results. <clears throat> so we've got uh, this housing crunch affecting uh, virtually everybody in California, but specifically in our county, uh, in Monterey County, and I'm sure that uh, it, it, you know even south of us it would be a, as well affecting those folks. It's it's the California thing. Um, so what do you have uh, in mind? And uh, have you, uh, especially for our disabled too? Oh, I surely don't want to leave those folks out. But what do you have in mind in terms of addressing it? And maybe you can identify that problem, first of all, uh, with some stats and some information and things that you bring to the table, things that you've gotten from Sacramento, maybe as an assembly person or just doing all the stuff you're doing now. Well, you know, maybe to step back for some perspective, because uh, once again, to start in talking about the issues you had into potential solutions. I was on the Santa Cruz City Council from 1981 to 1990. Mm -hmm. Nine years. Mm -hmm. And we presided over, I don't want to claim credit, but d totally, but during that time, there was something like 700 units of affordable housing mm -hmm. created inside the city limit. And when you look back, how did that happen? Well, one was uh, the city doing a project where we brought land to the table and leveraged affordability. Some was leveraged affordability after the earthquake. Some was inclusionary housing, where we adopted an ordinance and said that any housing development uh, had to include a certain percentage that were affordable as a mm -hmm. ticket for their zoning. Mm -hmm. And at the time, there were federal tax credits and federal grants, so that Blaine Street, uh, there were certain places where real multi-unit uh, housing was constructed because of federal support. Mm -hmm. Well, in the 1980s, in the light part of it, that federal support was withdrawn and it went away. And available land really was used up. And at one point the council changed inclusionary to really create a fund rather than actually provide the housing in the individual projects. And that fund wasn't used in exactly the same way initially as that happened. So basically we did that and it just shows that all the conditions that allowed us to do affordable housing, mm -hmm. and there was also redevelopment, mm -hmm. which went away, and a certain part of redevelopment went to affordable housing. You had the tools to do it, a and now you really don't. Mm -hmm. And then you move that to the state level, mm -hmm. and we are arguably three million or three and a half million units short of meeting the demand of the people that live here. We live here uh, the in district California. That, okay, okay. And, and it drives okay. the prices up sure. because of the limited demand. Mm -hmm. It's particularly acute on the coast where everybody wants to live, yeah. uh, where there's not a lot of additional development. And uh, Scott, Senator Scott Weiner has proposed a bill that's hotly controversial and mm -hmm. didn't survive this year. Although mm -hmm. I think he's amending pieces of it into mm -hmm. to other legislation. Land use uh, issues. Yes, it was yep. real. It's no. really. To override local land use control mm -hmm. uh, for housing, a and his argument is, is that California has been wedded to single-family housing, and that's just not providing for it. You have to do densities in multi-unit, and it's really caused uh, a lot of consternation 
in smaller cities where people think that they're going to have to uproot neighborhoods and build big development in them. And as I, you know, I've moved through 21 cities in the district. I happen to have the endorsement of 19 mayors right now. But Say it, that again. I have the endorsement of 19 of the 21 mayors that are in the Senate district wow. for the Senate seat. But wow. the point being, okay. I had to talk to all 19 of them. Yes. And in meeting yeah, with yeah. them and talking, yeah. almost to a person, they didn't like this bill. Mm -hmm. they, they felt like uh, th that was really getting into their prerogatives mm -hmm. to say that states should override local zoning. And if you look at the cities through the district, they're struggling to mm -hmm. provide affordable housing. Sure. And there are a few, Gilroy, Morgan Hill, some places in San Luis Obispo that have been able to do it. Santa Cruz is actually providing the units of housing, just not at the affordable level mm -hmm. as the city. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, is how to do that. And, the, and my concern with the Wiener bill, Senator Wiener's bill, is that he wanted to override the zoning to build housing, but there was no guarantee that it was going to be affordable. Uh, uh, you yeah. might use density bonuses, and density bonuses require a certain amount of affordability, but mm -hmm. that isn't necessarily clear. Before the bill died or was killed, uh, there was an amendment that it only applied to counties that were 600,000 in population yeah. or more, which yeah. then meant it didn't apply to Santa Cruz, yeah. Monterey, or San Luis Obispo, yeah. but it certainly applied to Santa Clara and San Jose. And San Jose has done a great job of doing uh, high-density housing in different places. And if you look in my regular drive to Sacramento, I go up through Milpitas and Fremont, and they're putting about 1,000 units next to the new BART station mm -hmm. right there. It's being built as I go by every mm -hmm. week. And that. that's the way it should be. There should be density near transit, mm -hmm. and yet... Uh, it's really tough to override local land use. So I think that's, and my argument to local officials is, is the best argument to fight overriding local land use is to build affordable housing. If you're building affordable housing, you really push back on the argument that you need to override zoning to get there. You know, in, in, uh, in that sense, uh, let's talk about affordable housing a little bit uh, in terms of uh, from the developer's view. Um, I uh, have been involved in some of those uh, projects um, uh, as a commissioner, and uh, you know I, I get it firsthand. And uh, you know that people do come in uh, and they want approval for projects, and then uh, they can buy out of uh, you know the affordable housing part um, by doing some other things. And, and we, we've got some other alternatives, like a, it's a little bit easier to do an ADU, a granny unit, uh, than it has been in a lot of years. Um, in fact, if you go to the county website, uh, and I think more more and more counties are doing this. Uh, you pl put in your uh, address and it'll tell you the size of unit that you can uh, build for an ADU and what the possible cost might even be. Uh, and it's very cost effective and it helps um, for people to see kind of firsthand that there are some alternatives out there that maybe they hadn't considered. But uh, coming back to the, well, I guess let's, let's land on the, the land use thing a, a, a little bit. Land use uh, certainly is complex and especially in ag areas. Um, and, and predominantly, we have a, a large agricultural uh, uh, community in, in South County, uh, you know, with all, all the growers that are there, apples and all the other uh, things that are grown there and famous for some of the best avocados in the state. Uh, certainly small areas, but uh, it, how do we get around or how do we address those land use issues if something, uh, and certainly the big, big issue right now is marijuana, uh, the cannabis uh, use for the greenhouses and things. But how do we get to those issues? I mean, how do we balance out so that the housing can be seen in a more positive fashion when, let's say, the ag is being impinged upon? Or, or do we? I mean, what, how do we uh, navigate well, that? Well, the word you used that's the right word is balance, is how do you figure out how to balance it the right way? And, you know, in my job as resources secretary, I tried to bring back the agricultural land preservation project. Uh, mm -hmm. The Williamson Act hadn't been funded in a few years, mm -hmm. and through cap and trade money or money that comes through the climate change program, uh, we spent money to preserve, I think in the end, 100,000 acres of agriculture by doing permanent conservation easements. And the real idea is, is, is that uh, prime, prime ag land is at a premium. Mm -hmm. You don't want that to go away. At the same time, you have to build housing, and so it probably means that the only way to do it is in densities that are higher in a way that you're not encroaching 
on the natural resources because frankly, we've built in almost every uh, a place that isn't in a high fire zone, isn't in a flood plain, um, isn't prime ag land. Mm -hmm. And if those things are what's gonna challenge it over time uh, if you do it. And so we really need to protect the ag land because it is the economics, it is the income, you lose it and it is probably lost for all time. And there's some, I mean, the ag land that's paved over in the Silicon Valley that were incredible orchards mm -hmm. is really a lost thing. And it's not to take away from the economic engine that is the Silicon Valley, but mm -hmm. that was something that was really incredible and it's challenged in the Central Valley. And you, you know, there's one place, since this might be broadcast in Monterey County, uh, I always use King City as as the good example because King City is surrounded on four sides. One side is rangeland, two sides are prime agricultural land, mm -hmm. and the fourth side is a river. It's the Salinas River, and that those are the boundaries of the of the city. Mm -hmm. And there was really a decision to do agricultural easements on the prime ag land. No, you're not going to build into the river. So if there's ever going to be uh, uh, intense growth in King City, mm -hmm. it's going to be in the lesser value rangeland that's to one side. That was sort of sound future planning that balances the urban area with a river and prime, prime ag land and sort of prioritizes and does it. And they've attempted to do it in other places in Monterey, whether it's around the north side of Marina and the Artichoke Fields or half of Castroville or some of the other places where they're really trying to protect where the ag land is, but there needs to be an understanding that housing has to come with it at some point in the area that is, that is uh, uh, in the existing footprint that's been developed. Mm -hmm. um, I'll touch on a, uh, a probably a difficult, uh, challenging, um uh, request of you but to talk about something and then right after that we get to get into the no bashful uh, zone which you get to talk about all the things you've done which are <laughs> a lot of them so uh, uh, but anyways let's talk about if you wouldn't mind uh, rent control um, what do you see and, and certainly uh, uh, there's there's challenges on both sides uh, you have pro and con and, and it's a very intense uh, issue especially uh, in smaller communities that are expensive but can you give us your take on rent control, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, in areas uh, like the Monterey Bay area, all the way down to San Luis Obispo? Well, the, the heart of your question is, is in, was on the ballot in Santa Cruz, and it failed yeah. uh -huh. uh, uh, very strongly in this last November's election. Mm -hmm. And it was on the ballot. We put it on the ballot when I was first on the city council almost 38 years ago, mm -hmm. and uh, it failed by a couple of thousand votes. And I think that a more moderate kind of rent control might have been more successful if, in fact, um, it was enforced by court. There was just a, a percent mm -hmm. that might have been related to the consumer price index. That might have been something that the voters would have done. I think it's to the point now mm -hmm. with what happened in the election uh, last year that the only way it's going to work is if everybody's at the table and everybody gives and takes in some way. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that that can happen, but that's what it's gonna have to be. Some people are gonna have to uh, agree to further densities. There might need to be some controls on, on the affordability of some of the houses that are built in, in those densities. How do you manage that? But it's every, I mean, I spoke to the Board of Realtors, which is sort of the other side of the rent control advocates, and they were very concerned about what my position was. And I said, you know, it's kind of out of my hands right now in the sense that things are only gonna happen if people sit down at a table and agree to them, uh, uh, with everybody giving something and everybody getting something. And mm -hmm. that's gonna be the challenge. That's never easy. and It's never easy in this particular community either. So yeah, such a contentious, challenging uh, issue for uh, any of our legislators or any of those uh, lawmakers that are out there trying to, you know, keep everybody happy in it. Well, you know, when I was in the legislature, there's one distinction I want to make, and that is, is I always drew a distinction between mobile home rent control and more conventional rent control. Mm -hmm. And in mo mobile home rent control, it was a settled issue. Uh, the people owned the mobile home, but they were hostages. They didn't own the land that mm -hmm. was underneath. Yeah. And so there had to be an agreed fair rate of return 
uh, in exchange for protected uh, rent because they couldn't really lift up what they owned and take it out. That's been very contentious over time uh, sure. in court suits and, and if you have a, um, a mobile home law that is complex in any way, it gets sued and uh, mobile home companies have much more resources than the individual cities and so some of the cities walk away from ordinances because they don't have the money to defend it. Mm -hmm. That's the tough one and that's mm -hmm. a place where there really needs to be some protections. Mm -hmm. uh, my mom is about to be 95 and she's in assisted mm -hmm. living now but okay. she had a, a mobile home for five years before she went into assisted living and Mm -hmm. uh, I was very conscious of the fact that she couldn't just move it, uh, and, but there was equity and the people getting a fair rate of return that owned it and in exchange for protection so that her rent as a person on a fixed income didn't go off the charts. Hmm. Very good. You know, it's, it's amazing to think we've got about eight minutes, uh, the time goes by and uh, as usual, uh, all my electeds or electeds to be are always engaging, and you are definitely we've got a ton of information, and it's good information. Uh, and one thing that I see shining through is you've got a love for uh, doing this. Uh, it, it's not a chore; it's something that you uh, uh, certainly cherish. Oh, there are moments. Yeah, there's, well, there's got to be moments. Yeah, uh, yeah, people yeah. were arrested in the meetings regularly <laughs> at oral communications. I think the second time I was mayor, I could have gone my whole career well, we'll without that, that happening. Yeah. yeah. So you get to get in, you get to do some fun stuff now, uh, and you can't be bashful. Uh, would you uh, mind take, uh, talking briefly uh, about some of the most prominent accomplishments um, in the assembly, uh, and maybe you just camp out there, Cabrillo trustee, and you might get one or two with the time running out. Uh, Santa Cruz City Council, the California Secretary for Natural Resources, and Executive Director of the Santa Cruz AIDS Project. What? What? Uh, maybe if we could talk about three of them briefly. Oh, there's. There's something in each of those that, that was good, but let me, uh, being Secretary of Natural Resources, the interesting thing was is that you, you had everything fly at you, and, and I used to say, if it was going really well, it never got to my desk. Mm -hmm. And so I, and there were a couple of things that I just took the initiative to resolve conflicts, and one of them was is, I mentioned the marine protected areas off the coast. Mm -hmm. Well, at the beginning, we had done, I think, the, uh, from the Mexican border to Sonoma County, and we hadn't done Mendocino, Humboldt, and Del Norte. And there were these big disputes about whether people wanted them, how to do them. Uh, and there were 28 uh, Native American tribes. And the Native American tribes were opposed to marine protection because they felt like it impinged on their historic rights. Mm. And so the first day I was secretary, a good friend of mine who was in the legislature from that area uh, called and said, I'm gonna introduce this bill that exempts the uh, tribes from marine protected areas. They can do whatever they want. Doesn't mm. matter what you're doing in conservation, they could do it. And I said, well, I know how the legislative process works. You won't amend the guts in the bill for at least three months. Can I negotiate and can I see uh, uh, where I can get. So I did rounds of negotiations. They collapsed once. It was at the beginning of the administration. I didn't fully have staff. There weren't people in places. And by the mm -hmm. time we were done, mm -hmm. we successfully negotiated with the tribe. So if they wow. could demonstrate a historic take for subsistence or for ceremonial purposes in the conservation areas that weren't the, the most highly protected areas, mm -hmm. they could do that. Mm -hmm. And they jumped at it. All 28 are in agreement with the state to do that. They move from opposition to support. Mm -hmm. And the one time that the cheapskate governor I worked for allowed me to take a foreign trip, as long as uh, somebody else paid for it, I was on vacation, all this stuff, that the way he operated, I led a delegation of indigenous people to the International Wilderness Conference so they could tell people around the world how we did it in California on marine wow. protection. Wow and uh, uh, take the word. So there are a couple things like that, but those are the kinds of things, and they might not be some of the biggest problems I solved, mm -hmm. but they were the most satisfying. Mm, very good, very good. So uh, we're close to closing. We've got about maybe four minutes, three minutes left. 
Um, what would you like to leave our listening audience with uh, in about a minute uh, or less, um, or a minute and a half or something like that, uh, and, and any thoughts that you have um, that have uh, uh, been rumbling around and you're thinking, I'd like to leave this with my people to let them know, uh, the people that are listening to the show, about a little bit about John Laird. Uh, and quite frankly, when they go to the polls, what can they remember about you uh, that you would like that to be? Well, about? I want to turn the question back because... Uh, while I would love for them to go to the polls and vote for me, I think this, we're all in this together, and it's not going to work unless they inform themselves, they have opinions, mm -hmm. they periodically come to meetings, mm -hmm. they vote. We are very lucky. Uh, uh, you look across the world, and not many uh, uh, countries relatively have the ability to control their own destiny, to mm -hmm. choose people, mm -hmm. to inform themselves. And I think we have lost a little bit of civic engagement. And, and I would just like to work with everybody in this district on that civic engagement. So together there's informed decisions and we attack some of these problems because the solutions won't stick unless they're involved in them and they believe in them and, and we try to work it out. Excellent. Um, so, uh, Closing, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for being uh, such a great guest uh, on Let's Talk with Lou, uh, Community TV of Santa Cruz. It, it just makes sense that uh, since you've done so much for us that you would land here, you know, right before you really start a, a strong campaign. Uh, and, and I hear you have officially launched it, uh, which is wonderful. Uh, I, I, uh, I kicked myself that I didn't go to it. I, we were doing some fun stuff, some uh, uh, some uh, mama do's, you know, <laughs> my wife said, oh, you can do this and this, so chores. But anyways, uh, yeah, thank you for all you're doing uh, for our community uh, and for what I think you will be doing uh, in, in the near future. Uh, what a great thing uh, to be able to do the kinds of things you do and, and have such a love for it. It, it just, it, it shows. I, I truly mean that too. Um, I'd like to, first of all, thank uh, some of our people, all our folks who are volunteers, including myself. Uh, Dave Goldman, studio supervisor. Thank you so much, Dave, a friend. Uh, and on camera as well. Uh, uh, Karen Scott, Computer Graphics. Uh, Keith Gudger, uh, Director and Co-Producer. Uh, Ron Powell on cameras. Uh, Rob Gray on audio. Uh, Galian Harbor on camera. Patrick Delaney on camera. We've got a great crew. Everybody goes through uh, a lot of training and they're committed to what they do. So we, we thank you so much for what you do out there uh, and all for Community TV. We will rebroadcast this uh, several times and uh, this will be broadcast in Monterey uh, as well. So, um, you know, look at uh, the things that are happening here at Community TV and each of our Community TV areas have uh, certain characteristics and certain cultures about them and they all serve a different purpose. And this is traditionally Santa Cruz, but this, uh, again, uh, this is a show that will go to Monterey and uh, that's why we have, uh, have had John uh, Laird. We will uh, begin to have many more of the folks that uh, both cover Monterey and Santa Cruz uh, in bigger areas, uh, such as Jimmy Panetta uh, and uh, other areas uh, where so we have a bigger area to cover. So anyways, thank you so much for uh, everything uh, that you bring, all our volunteers. And any last words? I think we got about 10 seconds, 9 seconds, something like that. <laughs> we're, we're close. Just thanks for watching. <laughs> okay, good, good. We're looking forward to... Uh, uh, you being able to be a public servant again, hopefully. Thank uh, you. So, yeah, thank you for all the things that you've done. Uh, thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, yeah good. <laughs>